All right, Inaga. Yeah. Um, so I was invited here to talk about my eight years experience working with companies globally, helping them innovate and solve some of their, their most critical challenges. So I wanted to tell a little story before I kick that off, because my journey into innovation started about 12 years ago um, in a little Faroese shop called Siri. Um, Siri, she's sitting right there. It's a lingerie shop on the Faroe Islands. And in, and in 2011, we decided that we needed to develop an app, right? So uh, we went ahead, developed the app, and we launched it on the App Store. And the Faroe Islands is a small market, right? So we expected a few hundred people to download the app. But in the first few days, we had thousands and thousands and thousands of people download the app. And I was like, there's something wrong, right? There's something wrong with the numbers or the analytics. So I called the app developers, and I was like, what's going on here? They're like, no, it's right. This is the most downloaded app that we have. On that day, we launched the app. Um, Apple had launched Siri, you know? It was a new iPhone with Siri. So everyone flooded to App Store to download the app. And in a few days, we had hundreds of thousands of downloads, right? We then started charging for it. And in three days, we made 30,000 Danish krona, yeah? And we got so much web traffic. My auntie was getting love letters because it was a lingerie store, so a lot of women in lingerie, so they thought it was her. Anyway, so that was my journey into innovation. Um, it's called Sikta here, Harald, yeah? Okay, yeah? Is it, is it this one? Yeah? Okay. So, um, Fortune 500, right? These are the 500 largest company on the planet. Um, Forbes recently did a survey, and 50 years ago, the life expectancy of a Fortune 500 company was 75 years. Today, that number is 15 years, and it's declining, right? So the life expectancy of these big companies is just shorter and shorter. Look at that. Yeah. Okay. shifter. Okay. Sorry. No. Um, so it's shorter and shorter and shorter, right? Um, so it's down to 15 years. Can anyone tell me how many of the Fortune 500 companies that were listed 50 years ago, how many do you think are alive today? Higher saying 200 over there. Yeah, this is like a bidding competition. How? Yeah, the fairies are shy. So there's 15, yeah, that's a good number. Um, so 60 of the companies listed uh, 50 years ago are still alive today. So I'm going to try to yeah, change the slide. So that means that the world is changing super, super fast today. I think we can all acknowledge that, right? Because like, there's so many challenges, right? There's a war in Ukraine. There was a supply chain crisis. There was a pandemic. So the companies that we work with at Vasurku, they're facing these massive, massive problems, right? And they need to develop tools and processes, right? And, and the methods to adopt to that change, right? And to be more agile. And that's what we do, right? Yeah. Um, and there's also like startups. We've seen a few pitches here today. Um, startups, they are entering markets. They're disrupting these big companies, right? But why aren't these big companies coming up with these startups themselves, right? They have the capital. They have the people. Uh, they have the market. They have customers and so on. So the conditions are very favorable. But companies are not very good at it, right? Uh, Linda Yates, she wrote a, a pretty good book about this, right? And she's saying there's no reason why one of the big hotels company didn't start Airbnb. Now, what we think it is, or we did a survey recently with, with our customers. So we're working with some of the biggest companies uh, globally. Um, and we found out that they only leverage 0.05% of their human capital when they try to solve problems, right? So if you're trying to solve a problem in a big company, you bring in a few people, right? And they try to come up with a solution. But they might have thousands of employees out there. So why don't we tap into that collective intelligence 
to find ideas and solutions to our problem. Yeah? Another problem is that companies, if we look at this is the long tail of innovation, right? So here we have people, and then we have the level of expertise or skills within any sp specific area, right? So as an example, if we take um, Novo Nordisk, yeah? They do diabetes medicine and so on, right? Or insulin. They will have a lot of experts within like highly, like high expertise in diabetes, right? So there's a, you can see a spike here, and there you have the general population, the standard deviation curve. That's how they see it. They think that they have all these experts, but the, the world is so big, right? There are other companies out there that are doing insulin, right? So if we look at it from that perspective, like we zoom out a little bit, you'll see that that's how big Novo Nordisk is and their talent, right? And there's a whole world out there. And also, if we look at the, the green bit here, a lot of people that are super, super skillful that could help them develop some solutions to solve their problems. Yeah, so if we hone in on that a little bit, right? So here we have Novo Nordisk, people in that field, in the diabetes field, but then you have all these adjacent talent as well, yeah? And at Vasoku, um, that's what we're trying to change, right? We're, helping, we're trying to help companies tap into that general population, also that all those people, all those experts, but also tap into the knowledge within the organizations, so to capture all those ideas in one place, yeah? We believe that by doing that, yeah, you, can, you will be more agile, you will uh, solve challenges in a smarter way, um, and you can get products quicker to market. Yeah? So that's what we're trying to do, change the world one idea at a time. So I'm talking here a lot about ideas, right? And an idea is only so much on itself. Um, so I said I've, I've been doing this now for, for eight years, um, and oftentimes companies, they come to us and say, you know, we want to be innovative, we want to capture ideas, because it's kind of a logical thing to do, and you read a book and it says, oh, you should listen to your employees and you should capture ideas. That's all well and good, right? But you need to combine that with, with action, right? Because if you don't invest in the ideas, then they're just ideas, okay? If the startups here today, if they hadn't done anything with their ideas, they wouldn't exist. They would just be concepts. So you need to combine that with action, and only then do you drive change. Um, we've developed uh, something that we call challenge-driven innovation. So challenge-driven innovation is a way where you go, you, you say, hey, we have a problem to solve. Yeah? Then you allocate those resources towards that challenge, and then you go out to the right people to ask for ideas. Then you're way more likely to get ideas that can solve a problem that you have, right? and that can help the company. Right? This guy here, Steven Shapiro, he has written a number of books about it. It's, it's worth um, a read. This is just changing. I don't know why. OK. Yeah? And he was saying, the questions you ask today will predict the future that you have tomorrow. Right? So you need to ask the right questions. And at Vasoku, we, we're super good at asking the right questions. Yeah? We've, we have 22 years of experience. We launched about what we call challenges, 2,500 challenges. And we've helped companies capture about 200,000 ideas from our community. So we also have a community of 700,000 experts globally. So when we think about that long tail of innovation, yeah, we have 700,000 people there that companies can go out to and say, hey, do you have that idea that I need to solve my problem? Yeah? So just to conclude there, so we believe that when you ask the right questions, you, then, you can then go out to your audience, your employees. You can open those questions out to everyone here, to the wider world, to your supplier, or whoever it is, and capture their ideas. And at that point, you can drive change, right? And not only drive change, but you create that process um, and that culture in the organization where you can confront any challenges and, and solve them really quickly and, and in a smart way. Okay. It's going the wrong way now. Okay. Um, so I wanted to tell some, um, some stories or give you some examples. So we work with a company called Waitrose in the UK. So anyone who has been in the UK, they've probably seen this uh, supermarket. Waitrose has about 90,000 employees across the country, right? It's one of the big chains over there. 
and they rolled out Vasoku to all their employees in order to capture those ideas from people working in their warehouses, in their shops, right? Because they believe that those people that are really close to the customers, they will have valuable ideas. So one uh, example is a lady, she worked in one of their, uh, one of their shops in, in Yorkshire. Um, her name is Janet, and she was sitting at the till and she saw all these receipts being printed out, right? And they were super long receipts with a lot of text and, and, um, and white space. And she said, hey, why don't we cut all that out, right? Doesn't really make sense to have it. So she submitted that to the Vasuku platform. It went through the process, and there was someone sitting in the IT team in their headquarters in Bracknell who said, you know what, I can do something. I have access to the system. He, he took her idea, implemented that idea, and that saved them 100,000 pounds per year, right? So roughly a million uh, Danish krona per year. That's one idea, right? And they capture thousands of those ideas every single year, right? And their program, the aim was to, to save 300 million pounds yeah, in savings. They just hit that. That's around 3 billion Danish krona, right? Just from those small ideas. So ideas, does, they don't have to be big ideas. They can also be those small continuous improvement ideas. Yeah. These guys, this is a, a super cool use case, you know? Like we're going to Mars and to the moon and that kind of stuff. Um, and if we think about NASA, right, we think about rocket, rocket scientists and all these very, very, very smart problem, uh, people, right? And you would think that, oh, they can solve any problems. But they had an issue. Uh, they couldn't figure out how to predict solar flares or solar events. And solar events, uh, they are quite disruptive. Um, they impact the International Space Station, our satellites, and they didn't know how, how to predict them. So they came to us and they said, hey, can you uh, help us tap into that long tail of innovation, right? Can you help us find some experts to solve this for us? Um, and they launched that as a challenge. Um, and they, were, they said, if you have the idea, we'll pay you $30,000. So fine, uh, it, the challenge was open for a month. And one of these, one guy in New Hampshire, he was a retired ra radio engineer. He said, hey, I have this tool, you know, like I, I think this could help you guys. So they took that and the rocket scientists, they were looking into it and they're like, this is awesome, right? So they deployed that and that allowed NASA to predict solar flares eight hours in advance with an 85% 85 85 accuracy. Yeah, and that was a retired radio, radio engineer in New Hampshire that came up with that solution, not one of their rocket scientists. And they only paid $30,000 for it. So, does anyone know this man? He's not here, is he? Ah. Um, it's actually quite funny because I was preparing, I'm staying at Hafnia, and I was, pre 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 uh, I was preparing the slides, and I had him on my screen, right? So I was there, and then I looked up, and he was standing right in front of me. <laughs> I was like, you're on my screen as well. He's like, what? And then he sat down, and we had a coffee and chatted about this. Um, so I wanted to bring a local example uh, of crowdsourcing. Um, I was thinking about it, I was like, is there one? And then I looked at, uh, I was watching Dara Vika, it's the news channel here on the Faroe Islands, um, and this guy was talking about it. So basically he's the chairman of Smearline, it's the ferry that goes from, from the Faroe Islands to Denmark. And one challenge they had is that, you know, now we have electric vehicles. And if one of them catches fire, it's almost impossible to extinguish that fire, right? It will burn for like 24 hours. And Smearline has a responsibility, right, to their passengers that, you know, they should be safe to travel to Denmark or wherever they're going. So anyways, so he, uh, he went out and he looked for some solutions. Um, and there was someone working in the cra uh, crab industry who said, hey, we have this, like this metal rod, right? And we use that in the crab industry to freeze crab. So basically you spray brine, which is super cold, and it freezes the crab. So I was like, hey, can we maybe use this to cool down a burning battery? Um, and they took that, developed it out a little bit, and just tested it on, on smear line, right, on a burning um, electric vehicle. And it worked. It cooled down the, the battery to zero degrees. It produced almost no smoke. And there you go. So now it's a bit safer to 
travel on smear line, but it's also a patented solution, right? Something they can now go out and commercialize, right? And you wouldn't think that someone in the crab industry could help solve a problem with electric vehicles on board of Narna. So the point is that oftentimes those good ideas are found in the most random places, and that's what we try to do. We try to help companies find those good ideas that all of us have and apply them to the, to the right problems, and in that way, if I could change the slides, right? And in that way, we change the world one idea at a time. So that was it. Thank you.